Right. Let us continue with our discussion of spin one. We are currently in the middle of dealing with the quantization of the free spin one field with a non-vanishing mass. This is the simpler case. The more complicated case will be the one where the mass is zero, like in the case of the photon. But currently, we are still finishing the case with a non-vanishing mass. And there, the main problem was the number of degrees of freedom. Namely, the vector field A mu carries four components. But on the other hand, we know that the massive spin one particle has only three degrees of freedom. And therefore, we had to get rid of one degree of freedom by constraints. And uh, in order to solve the quantization of this um, um, vector field, we needed um, an equation of motion, the Broca equation of motion, which led to the consequence that the divergence of this a mu is actually zero. So d mu a mu must be zero. And for the Fourier modes, that means that the uh, epsilon polarization vectors dot p mu, they have to vanish. And so because of that, we spent some time in figuring out a basis of polarization vectors epsilon mu, which are orthogonal to p mu. And we found a basis. And uh, there are, of course, three linearly independent epsilon mu's, which are orthogonal to p mu. They differ, so they depend on p. But for each p, there is a basis of three linearly independent polarization vectors, which satisfy this equation. And they then enter the quantum field operator a mu in this way. So we have epsilon mu's summed over lambda. And for each lambda, there is a creation and annihilation operator, the usual Fourier exponential function. I suppressed here the arguments so that you see better the structure. But of course, uh, these objects here carry arguments. They depend on lambda and the momentum p. And so this clearly satisfies uh, this divergence relation, d mu a mu equals zero. And it also satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation because of uh, the dp tilde measure and the exponential functions. And together, both equations, Klein-Gordon and the divergence relation, they are equivalent to the full Broca equation. So it satisfies the necessary equation of motion. And we see here clearly from the three different lambdas that somehow there is built in the number of three degrees of freedom for each momentum. There are three creation and annihilation operators. The basis polarization vectors epsilon mu that we found also satisfy some relationships. We have specially chosen the basis in a nice way so that uh, the different epsilons are orthogonal to each other. So they satisfy such a relationship that the product of two epsilons for different lambdas uh, is either zero or one, depending on whether the lambdas are equal or different. So we have now set up our quantum field operator. And uh, so far, this a mu satisfies the equation of motion, which is nice. But we are not yet completely done with our quantization. So we need a part two of this. And uh, the main question now is, what about the commutation relations? Because we have not yet made sure that our field operator satisfies the required commutation relation. And that is what we need to do today. So let us do that. And in order to do it, we start with a claim, which we will then prove about a further relationship with the polarization vectors epsilon. Because uh, first of all, that uh, next relationship is very interesting and useful on its own. But it also appears in the computation of the commutators. So let's write down this relationship. It's a completeness relationship. If you sum over all the lambdas from 1 to 3, and you do this, epsilon mu of p lambda, epsilon mu of p lambda. So you sum over the lambdas, but you have two open indices. You do not contract two epsilons, but you regard them as uh, independent vectors. And uh, in this way, you create a matrix, a 4 by 4 matrix with two open Lorentz indices mu nu. And the question is, what is this matrix? It corresponds to a completeness relation. And the result is this metric tensor g mu nu minus plus p mu p nu divided by the mass square uh, of our field. Okay, so this is a claim. And it's a completeness relation. Um, 
from uh, satisfied by those three <coughs> basis uh, vectors. And you see the nice thing about our basis is that on the right hand side from this completeness relation, we have something covariant. So the covariant metric tensor appears and also our momentum appears. So the right hand side has a nice Lorentz transformation property and uh, therefore also the left hand side because they are equal. So let's prove this relationship. And uh, very often uh, in proving such relationships, we had similar ones for the spin order where we had u u bar sum over s, right, p slash plus m. So these are all completeness relations and the proof is often very simple. If you simply apply the left hand side and the right hand side onto some basis vectors, and uh, if the left hand side applied to all basis vectors gives the same as the right hand side applied to all basis vectors, the matrices must be the same. And so we have four basis vectors in our four-dimensional Minkowski space. And let's just apply both sides of the equation onto all basis vectors and see what happens. Let us start with the left-hand side. Let me write it schematically as this left-hand side, mu nu. Apply it onto a few basis vectors. So our four-dimensional Minkowski space is spanned by a basis, and what basis can we choose? We can choose the basis consisting of the epsilons. So epsilon of p comma lambda. Let's do the contraction of the left hand side with one specific epsilon nu with a specific p comma lambda argument. What's the result? Well, what is the result? Uh, this epsilon will be contracted with that epsilon here. Here the lambda is now a dummy index and the contraction between this epsilon in the sum and that epsilon outside of the sum gives either zero or one depending on whether the lambdas here are the same. So the sum collapses and the only term that remains is the one where this lambda is the same as that lambda. This product gives one so what remains, uh, sorry, minus one, and what remains is simply uh, the other vector. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry, uh, this is a misprint here. This is a misprint. We had it, I think, correct in the last lecture. Uh, the product gives minus one, which means, uh, which corresponds to this G lambda lambda prime. So and therefore we get here minus epsilon mu with the same argument P comma lambda. So, and that is true for lambda equal one, two, three. So we have already computed the left-hand side applied onto three different basis vectors, and we know the result. What is a fourth basis vector? A fourth basis vector which augments the three epsilons to a full basis of the four-dimensional Minkowski space. We need a fourth basis vector. Yep. The momentum, yes, very good. The momentum, P mu. That is linearly independent of all the epsilons. We see it from the explicit construction of the matrix. The, lin uh, the momentum is uh, not um, linearly, um, uh, it's no linear combination of the epsilons. Therefore, this is really a fourth linearly independent basis vector. And what is the result of the contraction? This p mu, p mu hits that epsilon mu summed over lambda, it is zero. So we know what the left hand side does if we apply it to four different basis vectors. Let's do the same for the right hand side. What is this? So we have this uh, minus g mu nu times epsilon. That gives simply minus epsilon with upper index mu. So that is now easy to evaluate. Then we have p mu p nu times epsilon nu. What gives that? Zero. That is zero. So that's just the result. And you see left hand side and right hand side give the same minus epsilon mu. That is how it should be. Now the last right hand side mu nu onto p nu. What is that? So let's calculate. Minus g mu nu times p nu gives minus p mu. And here p mu p nu 
uh, divided by m squared times p nu. What is that? Let's write it down. p mu, that is then times p squared divided by m squared. But p squared is equal to m squared. Therefore, that is just overall zero. And so that is the proof. We have four linearly independent basis vectors, and the left and right hand side are the same. So that's just left hand side equal right hand side applied on four linearly independent basis vectors. And so therefore, the, these are two e equal matrices. So that is a nice relationship. And you can memorize it. It's a covariant relationship fulfilled by the polarization vectors in our basis. There is a consequence which we will need in a few moments. The consequence is the following. So let's do the same sum over lambda from 1 to 3. And then a more complicated expression. P0 epsilon i epsilon j. Of course, always with the same arguments. Minus epsilon 0 pi epsilon j. Always with the same argument. What is this? So the combination is not motivated, but it will simply show up in the next calculation. Therefore, let's just work beforehand. So here we plug in our result. The first term gives from here minus p0 g ij. Then plus minus uh, plus p0 times pi pj divided by m square. That is the first term literally copied. From here, you replace mu nu by ij and multiply by p0. So that's just the result. Then the second term. The second term, first uh, epsilon 0, epsilon j. We plug in again the result. We replace mu nu by 0 j. 0 means the 0 component. j means one of the spatial components. So what is the metric tensor between 0 and j? That is 0, because we assume that j cannot be 0. So the first term is 0. And the second term is then simply uh, p0, pi, pj divided by m square. pi comes from here, and epsilon j is replaced by pj. And then you see that those two terms just drop out. They just drop out, and the result is minus p0, gij. That is a very compact result for this uh, long winded expression, which will show up in the next calculation. OK, having prepared ourselves, we can now come to the important claim of our commutation relation of the field operator. We need to satisfy the canonical commutation relations. And the claim is that they are satisfied by the following ansatz. Namely, the obvious ansatz between A's and A deckers. A of P lambda, commutator, with A of P prime, lambda prime. That commutator should be 0. But A and A dagger, with the same arguments, that is not 0. But it's, first of all, Kronecker delta between lambda and lambda prime. And then the usual. 2p0 times 2 pi cube times a three dimensional delta function of p minus p prime. That is the perfectly usual normalization. The only difference to the spin zero case is the additional Kronecker delta lambda lambda prime because the a's now have arguments corresponding to this lambda index, which runs from 1 to 3. So these are not surprising commutational relations. On the contrary, they are the usual ones. But of course, we need to show that even now, in this much more complicated case, um, with constraints 
and where A0 is actually an auxiliary field and so on. Nevertheless, the commutation relations are satisfied. So let us actually spend a few moments to prove this. We have now done a lot of proofs like this, sometimes in the exercise, sometimes in the lecture. So let's once again do a little bit of that in the lecture. So we have equal time. This is always assumed in the commutation relations uh, between field operators in canonical quantization. And uh, a property between the epsilons is also that epsilon is equal to its complex conjugate. In our basis definition, the epsilons were real. They are real and so that is what we can now use in our relationship. So at the top, I still have epsilon star. That's the general case, but actually in our basis, epsilon star and epsilon, they are the same. Then there is one commutation relation, A i of x and a j of y. Okay, let me ask you actually how you feel about this. Uh, should I want to um, show you at least the commutator with pi, which is more difficult, but do you also want to see some details on that or should we, we you want? Okay, good, then why not? Okay, so, but it's the usual step that many of you have done already many times, but let's go through it once again. So we have this uh, dp tilde measure from here, another dp tilde prime measure from there. Then we have a sum over lambda from the left factor and a sum over lambda prime from the right factor. And now, uh, after having done many such calculations, uh, okay, you can ask me for something else, but uh, I would now do it in a slightly abbreviated form. But you can ask me to fill in some details because, you know, the point is you do not always want to write pages and pages with lots of arguments which drop out afterwards anyway. So let me show you the structure and maybe also show you how I would do it in my private life. So because we have already this abbreviated form of A where we skip the arguments. And then of course for the left factor we have here epsilon i, A, and then an exponential function with a minus argument. So that's all I would write, epsilon i, A, and e to the minus something, plus the complex conjugate, epsilon i star, doesn't matter, A dagger, and then e with plus in the exponent. And then, of course, you have to memorize what the arguments are. Here, the arguments are p comma lambda, p comma lambda, and in the exponent, we have i times p times x. Then, on the right, we have epsilon j times a times e to the minus, and so on. But the arguments are now p prime and lambda prime. So I would just write here epsilon prime, a prime, and uh, I memorize the arguments for the exponential, and then we have here also epsilon j prime, a prime, dagger, e to the plus, with some arguments. All right, and of course you clearly have to know that the arguments everywhere are different. Here the arguments are p prime, lambda prime, here the arguments are p and lambda, and uh, now the question is what happens? What happens? So if we have the commutator, we have four terms. We have this term, commutator with uh, that term here. That is zero because A with A gives zero. So then we have A with A dagger. That does not give zero. That gives a delta function with the appropriate prefactor. So what is the result of the red commutator? We have a times a dagger with different arguments. So we get a delta, Kronecker delta between the lambdas. That cancels the sum over lambda prime and lambda becomes equal to lambda prime. We have the usual prefactor and the three dimensional delta function between p and p prime. That cancels the dp tilde prime integral including the measure prefactors. So then p becomes p prime. So then a 
dagger and a they are dealt with epsilon and the exponential function remains but the arguments are the same so we have one dp tilde and one sum over lambda round bracket and then we have epsilon i epsilon j and an exponential function let me now write it down e to the i p times x minus y and here the arguments are p comma lambda all right then we have some other terms this term gives something non-zero with that term so here we have a dagger with a that gives the negative of that so it gives the negative otherwise everything is the same so we have minus because of the opposite order and then we have epsilon i epsilon j with uh, argument p comma lambda and the exponential function e to the plus i p times x minus y that's all so and then we see that the epsilon i epsilon j is summed over lambda that gives something that we know so it's a metric tensor or a bilinear expression in p and so we can now uh, make the two terms equal by doing this variable substitution that p goes to minus p in one term so if p goes to minus p in one term then here the exponential functions become equal but the bilinear product here does not change and therefore the two terms become completely equal so it becomes completely equal so the result is zero therefore the result is zero and that is the correct result for the canonical commutational relation of uh, two field operators then we can do the same with uh, pi And uh, there it's similar but more complicated and that expression will appear that we already calculated. But do you have any questions to this? So that is the usual procedure, right? If you want me to fill in more details, let me know. But now the same, but the result will be non-zero. and here we have the same on the left epsilon i a e to the minus plus epsilon i a dagger e to the plus comma and now what do we have on the right on the right we need to know what pi is what is pi pi is actually f j zero that is our pi field strength tensor so pi actually contains two terms one term is the derivative dj of a0, the other term is the derivative d0 of aj. dj of a0 minus d0 aj. Okay, so therefore we get twice as many terms here in the bracket, twice as many terms. Okay, but which terms do we get? Let's say uh, dj of a0, dj of a0, so what happens to this term? A derivative dj pulls down from the exponential function e to the minus ipx, dj pulls down minus ipj, right? So the first term instead of this will be minus ipj times epsilon zero a times the negative exponential. Is that clear? Good. Then uh, the other term with minus d0 aj is then plus ip0 epsilon j a and again the negative exponential. Then uh, from the second term we have the similar structure. So first we get the dj term that pulls down plus ipj times epsilon zero times a dagger times e to the plus and then we have minus d zero gives minus ip zero epsilon j 
a dagger e to the plus. And down, now, of course, all of the terms here have prime, so that is epsilon prime, p prime, a prime, p prime, epsilon prime, a prime, 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 prime. That means the arguments are p prime, comma lambda prime. That's what it means. So, and then we evaluate the commutator. And so we get twice as many non-zero terms as before. So let us begin with uh, this term, with A. So we need on the right, we need A dagger. So this gives something non-zero with this term first, and then also with that term. So what is the result? A with A dagger. Uh, cancels a de uh, sum over lambda prime, it cancels an integral over p prime, it makes the arguments equal, and then the result is simply the prefactors, namely epsilon i from here, then i times pj from here, and epsilon zero from here, and then the exponential function with a minus in the exponent. Then from the second term, again, uh, the arguments become equal and what remains is minus i p0 times epsilon i epsilon j uh, times e to the minus something. Okay. And that is the combination that we have computed with a prefactor minus i p0 epsilon i epsilon j and minus epsilon zero epsilon i p j. That is exactly the combination from over there. Now let's first do the other terms. Let's say the next term, a dagger with a. Two different terms. And what is it? So we first get a minus, oops, minus. Uh, because the order between a dagger and a is the wrong one, and so minus times minus gives plus, plus i p j, then epsilon i, epsilon zero times e uh, to the plus, and this term here, minus i p zero, epsilon i, epsilon j, e to the plus. Okay, so these are our four terms. And then we identify that they are exactly the terms that we had before. So that is the same. And here we then simply have minus i times what we had over there. So minus i, this combination, plus that is exactly the combination we had there. So the result is this minus p0 times gij. So minus i times minus p0 gij to be explicit. Then times the negative exponential. And here we have the same only with the positive exponential. So plus i overall gij e to the plus p0, and so we get the usual result, namely in um, our, let's write this down, the sum over lambda has been evaluated by going from here to here, and so we only have the p tilde integral. Then we have here p0 as a prefactor, the p0 cancels the one over p0 from the measure, uh, then one half remains in the measure, but we have two identical terms. The sign in the exponent doesn't matter. The integral simply gives a delta function. This is the Fourier transformation of a delta function. So here one half plus one halves overall give one. And then we have the remaining prefactor i times metric gij, i times gij times the three-dimensional delta function of x minus y. And so that is exactly the correct 
desired result for the canonical commutation relation. And so we see here that it is fulfilled by our ansatz to have ordinary creation and annihilation commutation relations between the A's and A deckers. So this ansatz satisfies the desired commutation relation, so it's the correct ansatz. And therefore now we have completely solved the quantization of our theory. Let us just write down some final words and conclusions. So the last points are very simple. So we also have the following relations, namely the commutation relation between uh, the Hamiltonian and a dagger of p comma lambda. This commutator gives p0 times a dagger of p comma lambda, which tells us that the creation operator creates a state of positive energy p0, which is again the expected and desired result. And the proof simply uses uh, the Fourier ansatz because we know what is this. And let me now sketch it. Let me sketch it because we have done things like this before. So this is equal to minus i times a dot for any uh, component a dot i of x. Okay. So you know the Hamiltonian with the field gives minus i times the time derivative of the field. Now look at the Fourier decomposition of this. Then you have here some Fourier uh, integral with a's and a daggers. And here you have some Fourier integral with a and a daggers and the coefficient p0 because of the time derivative. And so if you read off the Fourier modes on the left and right hand side of the equation, you immediately get this. And so therefore, we have our final physical interpretation of our theory. Okay, almost final. The Hilbert space of states is now constructed. So we have the vacuum state, which uh, so this is modeled after the harmonic oscillator discussion and the spin zero case um, vacuum, which is annihilated by all the A's. So we have a vacuum state, which is the state of lowest energy. Then we have one particle states labeled by P comma lambda, obtained by applying a dagger onto the vacuum. And here we have the label lambda, which runs from one to three. So in words, we have three linearly independent states for each momentum p, where p0 is equal to p vector square plus m square. So that tells us that we have three degrees of freedom for each momentum. There are three linearly independent states corresponding to some internal degree of freedom, probably to the spin. And the states have positive norm and positive energy. Why do they have positive norm and positive energy? Because of our harmonic oscillator discussion where we had the two different cases and uh, these relations here, this one, plus the previous one with A and A dagger commutators, they correspond to the normal case where we have indeed positive norm and positive energy. So it just matches the general, um, the general um, pattern. And then you can create multi-particle states, and these are then bosonic because of the commutation relations. And all of those states constructed in this way form a basis of our Hilbert space of states. And so we have consistently constructed a Hilbert space and on this space, the all operators have a well-defined uh, operation because all our operators 
consists out of A's and A daggers. Therefore, since the basis states are constructed from A and A dagger, we know exactly how all the operators act on any basis state. And so we have the full construction of everything. What is the last step in our blueprint uh, that we always apply to spin zero, spin one half, spin one? The last step after having constructed the Hilbert space of states is what? What do we still need to verify? You can think about what remains. Any answers? What remains to do? We may have to check if it's really spin one. Right. We have to check that it's really spin one. And how do we do that? We do it by constructing the Poincaré group generators. Not only Hamiltonian, but also momentum operator, angular momentum operator, even boost operators. And for the spin, we need to apply the angular momentum onto st states at rest. That is the easiest way. And once we know the angular momentum at rest, we know what the spin is. And so that is what we want to do. But as a byproduct, we will construct, of course, all generators for all Lorentz uh, transformations and translations. So that is P mu and J rho sigma. And for that, we apply our Lötter construction. We know that we have a symmetry, namely A is a vector field which goes to A prime mu with a prime mu of lambda x plus a is equal to lambda mu nu times a nu of x. That is the classical invariance of uh, the action. And so let us write this as an infinitesimal variation. a mu delta a mu of x uh, is the difference between a and a prime at the same argument x. And so we need to evaluate uh, A prime, not at the shifted argument, but at the original argument uh, x. And then on the right hand side, we get the Taylor expansion in infinitesimal uh, Fourier uh, Lorentz transformations. And I think we have done this sufficiently many times, even in complete generality as an exercise. So let me just copy the result. Uh, when we say that this is actually Omega, uh, given by omega and epsilon, we have epsilon alpha minus omega alpha beta times x beta times d alpha a mu. So we have to invent new names for Lorentz indices because now everything uh, has different Lorentz indices. So let's use alpha and beta. And then plus omega mu beta times a beta. Okay. So that uh, first line is the line that we always have. This just comes from the transformation of the argument. And this line always looks identically to this one. And the second line is the line which depends on the actual spin of the field. Uh, it comes from the external transformation, which is in this case lambda mu nu. In the spinner case, that second line was given by this S mu nu matrices. And here it's just uh, the product omega mu beta times A beta, actually simpler. And the Lagrangian transforms as always. Delta L is simply given by this first line, epsilon alpha minus omega alpha beta x beta d alpha acting on L. And then combining it, we get the conservation law. C rho is equal to D rho of the following DL derivative with respect to D rho A mu times the variation delta A mu. So this is the first term from the Noether conserved uh, quantity. And then minus the variation of the Lagrangian written as a total derivative. And uh, that is here plus uh, this object here, plus epsilon rho times L plus omega rho beta 
x beta times L. Okay. So that is our conserved quantity according to the Noether theorem. So this is conserved when the, the equation of motion is valid. There appears the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to this derivative, d rho a mu. That appears in the field strength tensor. The Lagrangian contains the field strength tensor squared effectively times one over four. So from the derivative, the one over four becomes one half, those field strength tensor squared. But the field strength tensor contains two terms and the derivative with respect to one of them cancels another factor of uh, one half. And so we get here from this overall equal to minus simply f rho mu with upper index rho mu. And then we have the explicit form. We can plug it in and we have a conserved quantity which depends on the infinitesimal parameters epsilon and omega. And then we can again read off coefficients in front of epsilon. That is the conserved quantity for translational invariance. And the coefficient in front of omega is the conserved quantity for Lorentz invariance. And then we have conserved quantities from which we can define momentum and uh, Lorentz transformation operators. So let's uh, do that. So the coefficient, maybe let's do it here. The coefficient in front of minus epsilon alpha, the coefficient in front of minus epsilon alpha, that will be called T rho alpha with upper index rho and alpha. And that is the conserved current for translational invariance in the direction alpha. So what is the coefficient? So we have here this minus f rho sigma times the variation of a mu coefficient of epsilon alpha. So reading it off, minus f rho mu times d alpha a mu. This d alpha a mu is the coefficient of delta alpha in front of minus epsilon. And then we have here indeed open indices rho alpha and we have a contraction over mu. Then uh, here there is an al uh, epsilon, the coefficient, if we write this as epsilon alpha, the coefficient is plus uh, minus g rho alpha times the Lagrangian L. Take the coefficient in front of minus epsilon alpha. So there we have it, and this also has open indices g uh, rho alpha, as it should be. Good. And then let us read off the coefficient in front of one half omega alpha beta, which would give us the conserved quantity m rho alpha beta. This is a conserved current corresponding to Lorentz invariance with indices alpha beta. And the conserved current has an index rho corresponding to charge density and the current density. All right, coefficient in front of minus uh, plus one half omega. So within the A, we have here this uh, omega alpha beta and so on. So uh, that will give without going through all the details as usual, x alpha t rho beta minus x beta t rho alpha. So in the normalization is such that we get this and uh, that takes into account this term and also a term from here from the Lagrangian and then there is one additional term which we don't get from here and that is the second line from the delta a mu. This is the second line corresponding to the outer transformation of the field corresponding to the spin. This is in addition and that gives here uh, um, this simply omega uh, times this derivative minus f rho sigma. So therefore we have minus f rho mu times g mu alpha a beta plus f rho mu g mu beta a alpha. So we need to bring that 
into a form where we have omega alpha beta instead of omega mu beta. And then so we see once again a term which corresponds to orbital angular momentum and a term corresponding to the spin. Then the conserved charges corresponding to momentum here. The momentum, full momentum is given by the space integral d3x over the density t0 alpha. So that is here p alpha. And so what is this? d3x. So if we have here uh, f rho, so let's maybe copy it first, 0 mu d alpha a mu uh, minus g 0 alpha times l. So and what is this actually? f 0 mu is um, plus f mu 0, that is the canonical momentum, right, pi. The canonical momentum pi was exactly this f mu 0. If mu is 0, then this vanishes, and the others are these pi i's. So we have here pi i, actually, plus pi i, times d alpha a i, summed over i. Uh, Yeah, minus g0 alpha times the Lagrangian. So one question that you can always ask at this point is, if you have alpha equals zero, we have the energy that should correspond to the Hamiltonian obtained from the Legendre transformation. So does that correspond to the Legendre transformation? Yes, it does. Pi times a dot for alpha equals zero, we have here pi times a dot minus the Lagrangian, fits perfectly. But for alpha non-zero, that term vanishes, and from here we have then a definition of our spatial momentum, the full momentum of our field. Then, j alpha beta, these are the conserved quantities corresponding to angular momentum and Lorentz transformations in general. D3x of this m0 alpha beta. And so that is just D3x integral over again the same thing. x alpha times t0 beta minus x beta times t0 alpha. And then the additional term so here, that is from here, and now the additional term, let's write down the additional term corresponding to spin for rho equals zero. For rho equals zero, here our additional term becomes um, f zero mu, which is the momentum again, pi. So we can immediately write it maybe as pi i, so mu becomes i. And then we have here a metric tensor G i alpha a beta. Uh, so okay, and then this can be simplified to pi alpha a beta, very simply, minus the opposite pi beta a alpha. where we have to uh, know that uh, if we have an index zero, pi zero is zero, pi zero doesn't exist. So, but that is our definition of the Lorentz transformation quantities, which can be then used as operators in the quantum theory. So, I see here some doubts emerging, maybe. Anybody see some mistake? Or surprising result? Yeah. Why is there a plus sign in front of the pi alpha? Uh, where was it? We already wrote it somewhere. Here. F0 mu with minus is plus pi i or plus pi mu. In general, pi 
is f uh, pi i is f i zero. And so that is where it comes from. Okay. Now it becomes a little bit dirty depending on how many details we want to uh, do here in the lecture because of course now we would like to use this definition as a definition in the quantum theory. So we will use that uh, for operators, uh, momentum operator and angular momentum and boost operators by plugging on the right hand side uh, really the operator expressions into those equations. And then we have operators and the question is do those operators defined in this way satisfy the correct commutation relations for a representation of the Poincaré group? And they do. The fact that they do is not a surprise because it is constructed using Noether's theorem and in general Noether's theorem guarantees that at least the Poisson brackets for those quantities have the correct structure and uh, usually nothing happens if we replace Poisson brackets by commutators in the quantum theory. But it's not completely automatic and not completely obvious because of the constraints and the fact that uh, there is not actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between all the variables a, mu and our operators because we only have a, i and pi, i as operators instead of a, mu. Nevertheless, it works. It has always worked so far and it also works in this case. But one should check it. We can check it and uh, I would say we check it for at most one example case and uh, depending on your input, maybe uh, for zero cases. So let we should now check, replace by operators. And uh, check the commutation relations. And to illustrate why it's not completely trivial, maybe we can do at least a little bit. So what are your comments? How much do you want to do in the lecture? You can do the rest at home on a scale from 1 to 10, where 10 is everything and 1 is nothing. Let's say 4. Okay. 5. Okay. Five agreed? Or anybody for less than five? No. For more than five? Okay. So, all right. Then let me clean the blackboard. Okay, five means that we do it a little bit explicitly. And what I want to focus on in particular is that amongst other things, there are commutation relations involving a zero. But A0 is not uh, its own dynamical degree of freedom, but A0 is an abbreviation for this. And so what is in particular interesting, and I think that is what we will focus on, is what are the commutation relations involving this A0? Do they have the structure that we expect? And if they do that, then I think we can believe the rest. That is my proposal. Good. So I would say the following. Let's interpret uh, these equations here. So the first term here in this uh, angular momentum and boost object clearly corresponds to orbital angular momentum and boost. And that thing here corresponds to spin or generalizations. That was always our kind of uh, interpretation. And so let me give this a name, J alpha beta uh, L where L stands for orbital, and this is then Js alpha beta, where S stands for spin, and then we can evaluate the two independently to organize the calculation a little bit. And so I would propose to look at the following 
commutators, namely now commutator with a hat JL KL of AI. Um, and this commutator will tell us how the field AI transforms under a rotation. This is the generator of rotations. The commutator with the field tells us how the field rotates, basically. And the question is whether we get what we expect. Similarly, we can then do it for the spin, JS, KL, AI. And uh, of course, only the sum should give the correct uh, expected result for rotations. And then afterwards, I want to do the same for the A0, where it is more complicated. So let's do it for all, so, so since you wanted a few details, uh, let's do first the simpler case and as a contrast afterwards the more complicated case. So what is this commutator here? So this has an argument x, argument x, and so in the integral we have now d3 x prime integral. And uh, for simplicity I really, really uh, focus only on KL indices where we know we have a rotation instead of a boost. And uh, so that simplifies a few things because we then know which commutators are zero and which are not. And the other case would of course be also interesting but would, it would be a different calculation. So let's do that. And then we have here the commutator of this thing x prime k t zero L minus x prime L t zero k uh, comma a hat i of x this commutator. So what happens if we do this commutator? Let's do it on the blackboard. So I need to plug in the value of this T0L. What is T0L? T0L is this object here. This is T0 alpha. So I need to write down this where I replace alpha by L. So let's do it here. That is the luxury of having a blackboard. So I replace here pi j u dummy index dL a j. Pi j dL a j. And here, pi j d k a j. Pi j d k a j. Then what's the next step? commutator between a and a product of pi and a. Only the pi contributes in the commutator because a with a commutes. a with pi gives i times a delta function between the arguments. Okay, so then we have it immediately. Uh, x is just a number, integration variable, so it's only what matters is the commutator between a and pi pi is on the left, so we get minus i times a delta function between the arguments. Therefore, what we get is just this expression here, where the pi is removed and the arguments are replaced by x without prime. So we get here times minus i. Minus i times x without prime, index k. Then um, the Lorentz index here becomes uh, i, so we have d l a i and here we have x l d k a i. Okay, how does that look like? It looks very beautiful. Let me write it like this. A i can also stand here. How does it now look like? Minus i times x k d l minus x l d k acting on i that looks like a normal angular momentum operator for an orbital angular momentum applied to our field. That is exactly what we would expect from orbital angular momentum operators.
that so we have a derivative operator acting on ai of x and here we have the same index ai as we have on the left. What happens if we do the same with a spin d3x prime commutator of this spin part? That is the spin part. So we have pi k al minus pi l a k commutator with a i of x. Then again, it's even easier. We have here pi times a. The commutator gives minus i times a delta function between pi and a. So we have here one term, which gives the uh, metric tensor g k i between the indices g k i times the remaining l l a l minus g l i times the remaining a k. So this is the commutation rule. Like it is expected for spin, uh, this spin operator does something to the indices of the field operator. So it changes the indices of the field operator, whereas angular momentum does not change the index, but it has to do something with the argument. Therefore, an orbital angular momentum is a derivative operator which acts on the same field with the same index, whereas from the spin, we get some combination of fields with different indices. That is the general structure. Now, let us do something. Namely, we do the same with pi. Let's do it also with pi. What happens if we do it with pi? If we do it with pi instead of a, we get essentially the same thing. Let's just uh, be quick. Imagine here the same calculation, but at this point we have pi instead of a. Then the same thing happens. Namely, you get a commutator only between a and pi. And what remains is the remaining pi. You can do partial integration so that the derivative operators act on pi. Then you get a minus sign. And the commutator is now a with pi gives plus i. And the minus sign from partial integration with a plus from the commutator again ends up with minus i. So we get exactly the same expression. Minus i times this acting on pi. xk dl minus xl dk acting on pi i. Same thing. And from the spin part, okay, we have here pi with some index. Then again, we get a chronicle or metric tensor between a and pi. And again, we have the same structure. i times, this time we have a plus i times g l i times pi k minus g k i times pi l. So, and now the big question is, what is the commutation relation between uh, the full angular momentum operator, including orbital angular momentum and spin? Let us do this with the A0 field. That is the most uh, tricky part, which is the least obvious. And so let us check this, what happens in this commutation rule. OK, if we do a rotation of A0, we actually do not expect to get anything from the uh, external index, because this is a 
zero index, so it shouldn't really interfere with a rotation in space. Therefore, the zero index should stay, but with the arguments, we should get the usual thing. So let us see what happens. And uh, we really need to plug in now our definition. A zero is an abbreviation for minus one over m square times then the commutator KL L plus S with this D I pi I. Okay. So this is the commutator. And so a spatial derivative can be pulled out of the commutator. Remember, we always have equal time commutator, so it's not automatically easy to pull out a time derivative out of a commutator, but it's uh, no problem to pull out a space derivative out of a commutator. So we have minus one over m square times di of the whole expression. So now we pull out this, and then we simply write down the commutation relation between j and pi i. And so that is what we have in the bracket at the top. We just copy it. So we have minus i times the first term, x k d l minus x l d k acting on pi i plus i then g l i pi k minus g k i pi l. So what do we get? What we get is something from evaluating the derivative. Let us evaluate the derivative with respect to di. What happens if we evaluate this derivative acting on the first term? This derivative now acts on this first term. There are two things that happen. Namely, what happens? We have a product rule. We have a product rule and the di appears on the one hand acting on the variable xk and on the other hand, it acts on the pi. So let us exhibit explicitly the terms that we get when the di hits the variable xk and xl. What happens in that case? So something else plus the term where the di hits the variable xk. What is the result of that in the bracket? We have then minus i times a metric tensor between i and k, d i k d l. Acting on pi i. And the other term plus i metric tensor between i and l times dk pi i. This is the term coming from this derivative acting directly on the variables. Okay, So we get these metric tensors between the indices i k and i l. What is the next step when we look only at those terms? When we only look at those terms, then we have here now g i k pi i. That gives d l times pi k plus i d k times pi l. Okay. Where do you see this term once again appearing on the blackboard? So this is now the result of applying this onto the variables. And I see here that this object actually also appears here. Namely, when we apply the derivative onto that term, what do we get here? We get the i acting on that. So metric tensor that just gives us a derivative dl acting on pi k. And that gives a derivative dk acting on pi l. That is exactly the negative of this. 
dl acting on pi k times minus i, here dl acting on pi k with plus i, and so on. So we see that the derivative acting on the variable cancels the derivative acting on the second term. Therefore, the only term that remains is the one where the derivative acts directly on the pi i. Let me write only this down, minus 1 over m square times minus i xk dl minus xl dk. And now the derivative di acts only onto the pi i. And everything else has cancelled. Rest cancels. So that is the result, and now we see that we have something directly acting on our A0, so namely we have minus i xk dl minus xl dk acting on our field operator A0. Yep. Can you explain once more uh, where you can pull out the derivative of the commutator? Uh, because the commutator is defined for equal times, but the commutator has uh, anyway argument x here. So we know what the commutator is for any value of x. Therefore, we can pull out the derivative with respect to x and still know what is the commutator for any x and take the derivative. Um, the j is, is x prime and it's an integral over x prime and this is an entire block which has absolutely nothing to do with the x variable here. But so simply think of the derivative as a limit from two different x arguments and so we know the commutator for any argument x as long as the time is staying fixed and therefore we can pull it out or in, that doesn't matter. That is the reason. And so as we discussed briefly, so for the time, it's not so simple because we know the commutators only if the two time arguments are equal. So you could not pull out a time derivative out of the commutator. Okay. And so that is actually the expected result for the um, field operator A0. And let me just summarize all of the results in the following form. So all of the results like this and similar ones with other indices that we do not uh, check now have the following implication. Namely, if you look at the uh, unitary representation of Poincaré on our space of fields, okay. so apply u dagger and u from the left and right onto our field operator. Then from the current calculation we see, at least for this example with index kl, that this is equal to a um, mu of x minus omega x plus omega mu nu times a nu of x. Okay. So for one example, we have checked exactly this equation. You know, because this equation here, if you expand the um, u operator, then of course you get here minus i over 2 times omega times j. You take the index omega kl, then this extracts the commutator of a with j kl that we have evaluated and the result is compatible with the shift in the argument. The shift in the argument always corresponds to exactly this differential operator acting on the field. And uh, this object here corresponds to the second term that we had at one point. Where did we have it? Here. This exact expression here corresponds to this additional term. So if you plug in omega kl, then this line is identical to all the commutators that we had before. But here it's in the form that we have. And so that uh, and similar calculations proves that the commutation relations are the ones that we desire. And therefore, let me now really summarize the quantum properties that we have established. So 
So what did we obtain? We have in a brief form, uh, the conclusions are basically the same as that we had for the scalar field. We have constructed operators P mu and J rho sigma. And from them we obtain a representation U of lambda and A in the usual form. The operators are Hermitian, they satisfy the correct commutation relations and therefore we know that this is a unitary representation of the Poincaré group on our Hilbert space of states. So we have a correctly relativistic quantum theory and a, a last equation in full form would be this u dagger of lambda a times a field operator and the simpler way is to write field operator at the shifted argument a hat mu at lambda x plus a then u without dagger of lambda a. This gives lambda mu nu times a nu of x. This is the full finite form of the equation that I wrote down just here and by example we have proved it. That means that uh, a mu is a four vector field operator. An operator with this property is called a four vector field operator. From this of course we also get further commutation relations as a, always by reading off the Fourier modes from the same equation, we would get a commutation relation between j rho sigma with some a dagger of p comma lambda. I will not give you the result, but you will get some result. You can explicitly calculate it and you can also calculate p mu with a dagger of p comma lambda and this one is easy to specify, namely we get the eigenvalue, so this is p hat mu capital P hat and this is small p mu, the number at lambda p, which means that uh, a dagger creates a particle with energy p0 and spatial momentum p vector as expected. And so from here you could determine what are the angular momenta of your particles and let me just say what we get with our definition of lambdas and epsilons. We get the following. If you have J Z acting on a particle at rest and you have lambda equal to three, then this state is an eigenstate of the JZ operator with eigenvalue zero. So lambda equal three corresponds to a Z spin equal to zero. And similarly for the others, JX acting on a particle at rest with lambda equal one, then this state is an eigenstate of JX with eigenvalue zero and similarly for JY if lambda is two, we have an eigenstate of JY uh, with eigenvalue zero. So we have constructed eigenstates of the three different angular momentum operators, but we, you could also act with JZ onto those states and then you do not get zero, but you get something non-zero and let me just write down if you act with J vector square on any such state at rest, then you get J times J plus one acting on the same state at rest with J equal one, of course. And that proves that we have spin one here. So 
okay, Blackboard is full, but you can write some final nice words into your notebooks. So this proves that the theory we have constructed is a fully relativistic quantum theory with a unitary representation of the Poincaré group. All operators are fully constructed, the space of state is fully constructed, all states have positive norm, which is not so trivial as we saw. All states have positive energy, which is also not so trivial as we saw. The field operator is a proper four vector field operator, despite this uh, different treatment of A0. We know all the commutation relations and uh, the particles described or created by the field. Um, correspond to massive spin 1 particles with mass m and uh, spin 1. So, and they are bosonic, so that is the final result. And with this, we have completely treated our spin 1 case uh, for the massive case. And so for the last 10 minutes today, we will just uh, make a few more comments and uh, the next time we will of course start with a massless case which is a little bit more tricky. Any questions? Yeah. That is the logic. That's exactly the logic. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Right. Very good. Okay. So one comment is on the massless or high energy limit. That, of course, leads then to the massless case, and we already alluded to it a little bit. So let me give you an explicit form of a massive momentum, P mu. The momentum, P mu, is of course given by the energy, and then here you have, let's say, in generic terms, uh, magnitude of the momentum P times a direction. This is a unit vector E P in which the momentum is oriented. And the relationship is E square is equal to P square plus the rest mass square. Then we have as a comparison our epsilon for lambda equal three. What was our third epsilon? Our third epsilon was similar to the momentum, but it had energy and momentum here reversed. So we had here P over M, and here we had E over M times the same unit vector. And then this epsilon satisfies all our conditions. It is really orthogonal to the momentum four vector, and it is also orthogonal to the other epsilons. But uh, obviously, it has a structure which is quite similar to the structure of the momentum. And now, what happens if uh, P mu over M goes to infinity? This is either the massless limit or the limit of infinitely high energy for a fixed mass. But it's the same limit. Anyway, in physics, only dimensionless ratios matter. And so what happens in this limit? In this limit, all components of both vectors here become infinitely large. All components here become infinite. All components here become infinite. And something else happens. Namely, they become equal because uh, the energy and the magnitude of the momentum for very, very high energies become the same. Since the mass becomes irrelevant, so the difference between E and P really goes to zero. Let's make that explicit. What is E minus P? So both become infinite, and what is the difference? 
Does it become small? Does it stay finite? Does it go to zero? What does it actually do? Or does it also go to infinity? So relatively, they become closer and closer. But actually, it goes to zero. So because we can write this as uh, if you solve this equation, e square minus p square is equal to m square, then of course, this is the same as that because of binomials formula, right? So and then you see that here both of them individually become infinitely large and therefore uh, that difference goes to zero. So two variables each go to infinity but they come infinitely close. And so therefore component by component those two vectors become equal. So P mu over M minus epsilon mu for lambda equal three go to zero uh, component wise. That is interesting to know. And so now we have to, let's say, drop something. Uh, often probability amplitudes in quantum field theory have the following structure. You get something, some object mu with a Lorentz index times epsilon mu, a polarization vector. That is a typical structure. This here could come, for example, from Feynman diagrams. And this here comes from our uh, photon, or uh, sorry, spin one particle. So some uh, matrix element between a spin one particle state and some other states easily will give rise to something that involves this epsilon because that appears in the field operator and some remainder. The whole thing is then Lorentz invariant and uh, it depends on this epsilon mu. And the combination here means a probability amplitude. Now in quantum mechanics, probabilities are the squares of such probability amplitudes and probabilities must be smaller than one. Otherwise the interpretation doesn't make sense. Therefore, it must not happen that this expression blows up and becomes infinitely large. It must be bounded by some number depending on the exact prefactors and everything, but it must be bounded. So whatever we do here in this limit, the expression must be bounded by some, some real number or some, some the magnitude must be bounded. And how can it be bounded if all components of this here individually become infinitely large? probability must be smaller or equal than one. And so how can it be bounded? The simplest way how it can be bounded is that you require that this m mu times p mu is equal to zero. Because if that is true, then for infinitely high energies, the epsilon approaches the p mu so the difference becomes smaller and smaller and uh, m times p gives zero and therefore uh, the terms which go to infinity within the epsilon, they do not contribute and therefore only finite terms can contribute. And so this is the simplest way to guarantee that such a spin one theory with interactions does not lead to probabilities which are bigger than one. And uh, so this is a restriction on possible interactions. And in the same sense, uh, you can take the massless limit. If you take the massless limit, then of course, again, uh, the third epsilon becomes equal to the momentum. And you know that in the massless case, there are only two physical degrees of freedom, not three. And so if you want a continuous massless limit, then the third degree of freedom should somehow not contribute. And that is exactly the same relationship that the third degree of freedom decouples or does not contribute anymore if you take the massless limit. 
And so this is an interesting relationship. And indeed, if we uh, the next time look really at a properly massless case where the mass is exactly zero from the beginning, then we will see similar relationships that uh, this must be valid for a consistent theory of spin one with uh, zero mass. Okay, time is up. Very good. So thank you very much for your attention and see you then on Thursday, not tomorrow. Thank you.